I'm Scott Al Miller. This is my life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today I have a viewer who had a bit of a concern that they really think they want to move to Nicaragua. They've done their research, they've looked into all the options, they've looked at alternatives, and without having come here yet, they're pretty sure that Nicaragua is where they want to be and where they want to be in the relatively short term. It really does make sense when talking to them, all those things certainly work out. However, due to timing with jobs and other factors in their life, having kids uh, and, and needing to be able to move relatively quickly and a few other factors, they're concerned that they may not have an opportunity to come to Nicaragua and see it for themselves firsthand, which they understand is super important for a lot of reasons before they are in a position where they might need to make that move. And so I wanna talk a little bit about this particular situation. It is an extreme situation. It is not something that normally Normal people are going to run into on a regular basis, but it is worth considering a few factors. And I think in the end, probably allaying some fears, uh, belaying some fears, but we want to go over exactly why this may make sense in this scenario uh, based off of some very important decision making. So I want to talk about a few of these things uh, and, and make a lot of people feel better about a potential move based on this, even though hopefully you do get a chance to see any country that you're moving to before you actually do it right after the bump. Most of my viewers are gonna have an opportunity to at least come down for a weekend or a week or a month to see Nicaragua or any country that you're considering moving to before you actually make that move. However, I must say with the current situation in Canada and even more so with the current situation in the United States, there's a lot of people who are suddenly making a decision that maybe they need to move a little bit faster than they had been anticipating or maybe they weren't anticipating moving at all and all this is hitting them all of a sudden and they're going to make a move too sweet. Well, that may leave you in a position where you don't feel comfortable taking the time to visit a country before you actually make the move there. And there are situations where this is absolutely fine to do, and I want to talk about that first, because I actually did a lot of this throughout my life. Now, the first country that I ever moved to outside of my home country, of course, was Spain. And I had visited Spain previous to having moved there. In fact, it was my visit there, which was a little bit impromptu, uh, that led me to be like, oh my gosh, I love this country. And my wife to have the same reaction. We love this country so much from the bit that we saw, we got to come spend a lot of time and really get to know a lot more of it. So that's exactly what we did. We basically came back uh, two and a half years after our initial visit. Uh, we had meant to go to Barcelona, but ended up in Madrid by accident, ended up taking a train all the way across the country. So we saw a bunch, saw Madrid, and we're like, Spain is so much better than we had imagined it would be. We're, we're missing things. We got to put in time. And so we moved to Granada and spent time in Sevilla and uh, Arcos de la Frontera and Cadiz and Cordoba and all kinds of Malaga, lots of different places and really got to know it. And I absolutely love Spain. We did this with the knowledge that, you know, there's no way that Spain is going to be so awful that a short term stay is going to be tragic. We might love it. We might hate it, but in no situation is it going to be, oh no, what have we done? We've ruined our lives. We knew we weren't staying permanently. So in that kind of situation, now this does not apply to the person who was asking the question, but it's for those of you who are wondering about these kinds of moves. For many of us, there is an opportunity to move from place to place, whether that's intentional, right? For us, it was, we're going to go to Spain, we're going to give it a certain amount of time, then we're going to move on to the next place. We didn't know where that was going to be at the time. Actually, we did. By the time we went to Spain, we already knew our next place was going to be Panama. So we we were ready for that. Once we were in Panama, though, we started adjusting our schedule. We thought we were going to be going on to Argentina after Panama, and we changed our plans for a number of reasons and ended up in Nicaragua. But when we were uh, in Spain, we knew we were going to be moving on because we were in a position where we needed to make decisions about countries, and we had narrowed them down to countries we were really interested in, most of which we had visited previously or felt really confident in. We had done our research. So if you were in a similar position to my family in 2015 and said, I want to come to Nicaragua, Nicaragua. I am able to stay. Uh, should we come and say, this is perfect. We don't even want to evaluate anything else. We're just going to stay. Great. You're under no, you can just come right sight unseen. You don't have to do a scouting trip first. Uh, or if you know you're going to move on, well, we already scheduled our next thing in Argentina. That's coming up in three months, six months, a year, whatever. We know we're going to move there. So we're going to move here and we're going to give it this amount of time. 
Now, there's places you don't want to do this with, places that you really can't research, places that are super, super scary, um, not necessarily violence, but it could be uh, the language may be something that's overwhelming to you, right? So moving to China, crazy safe. There's almost no violence in, in China. You definitely can afford to live in China if you can afford to live pretty much anywhere. It's not the cheapest, but it's, it's really inexpensive. Lots of good social services and such. So if you were going to move to China for a period of time, you might be like, okay, all these things work out. There's no way uh, that I'm taking a big risk in moving to China, except this language thing. And the language for you might work out. And I know a lot of people who've moved to China and been like, yeah, I learned the language. Like, that's just what you do. And a lot of other people go there and go, I can never read anything, right? So your experience can go either way. So that's a risk from a linguistic perspective that there, your time there may be scary and overwhelming and just more than you can take. So you don't want to necessarily, you probably don't want to take a huge risk of leaping into a place like China, assuming English is your only language when you just don't know that much about it. But places like Nicaragua, for most people, the language is very easy to deal with, especially if you're coming from the United States where Spanish is very heavily taught uh, in schools. Even if you don't know very much of it, you probably know a few words. And it's going to allow you to pick up enough. Plus, here in Nicaragua, lots of people speak English. So you do get quite a bit of people who can help you. Yeah, there's not tons of English speakers before someone says, I don't think there's a lot of English speakers. There are not. It is not like Costa Rica. It is not like Argentina where you can easily just have an English conversation on any street corner and it's something like 25 to 50 percent of the population speak it or Mexico where 50 plus percent speak it often with a higher literacy, literacy rate than the U.S. But you will have maybe one out of 20 people here in Nicaragua will be able to speak English, whereas opposed to China, it's nowhere near that, right? Uh, you have, you'll have whole cities where you'll never meet a person who speaks English, but here in Nicaragua, you'll always be able to find someone who speaks enough English to help you with something. You'll never be in that really tough situation of being like the language barrier is just insurmountable. So they'll almost always be able to find some way to understand you, assuming you're an English speaker watching my English channel, and you will almost certainly be able to either already have or easily pick up some amount of Spanish, and plus, plus the, the alphabet's the same, all kinds of things, right? So Nicaragua being a super safe country, almost certainly as safe or safer than the countries you're coming from, or at least very similar to. Uh, it's one of the safest countries around. Um, and being so dramatically inexpensive means that generally it's not a risk. So jumping into a country like Nicaragua, the same thing would go for El Salvador, the same thing would reasonably go for uh, Costa Rica is quite a bit more expensive, but you can estimate that little bit of difference as long as the financial is okay, then you're fine there. Panama in between. But again, like even those that are less safe are still not unsafe, right? So generally people consider Costa Rica safe or or decently safe. And Costa Rica is much more dangerous, especially for tourists, than everyone else in the region. And it's still considered decently safe. It's not as safe as the U.S. It's certainly not as safe as Canada, whereas Nicaragua and Costa and, and, and El Salvador are really competing with the U.S. and Canada on, on better grounds, right? So there's a little bit of, of relative here, but no one, no country in the region is so dangerous to the point where it would actually be a problem for you. If anyone was, it would be Honduras. Uh, and really, it's not a problem under normal circumstances. You do need, be, need to be a little bit more cautious and aware in Honduras compared to the other countries, but that's about it. It's not a thing where it would be scary to live there unless you're doing something crazy and living in a really bad neighborhood. Um, and the same thing, you know, Costa Rica, 300% the violent crime of Nicaragua. Even at three times our violent crime, it's still not that much violent crime. Now, the reality is we do talk about this as it applies to tourists is probably closer to 10 times. So that's important to be aware that it's crimes against tourists are common down there with a 300 percent violent crime rate of Nicaragua, whereas in Nicaragua, lower crime rate and it's normally, you know, criminals on criminals or, or uh, robberies in the barrios and things like that. Uh, so even the types of crime that we do have generally don't affect tourists too often it can happen. And there was something that happened two weeks ago here in Leon. Not a huge deal, a pretty big deal, but you know, no one died. Someone got robbed. They got slightly injured. It happens, right? It's going to happen anywhere. But in you know my hometown in New York, every day it's like, who died today, right? And here it's like, oh, this year someone was robbed? I can't believe that happened. So the scale of things is very different. But things do still happen, and it is still good to be aware of what you're doing and not look like a tourist unnecessarily. And don't be drunk in the middle of the night directly in tourist areas where there's no one to protect you and you really stand out as a target. So be smart about things anywhere, but you can be less smart here than anywhere else. So jumping into a place like Nicaragua, 
where as long as you do a little bit of research and, and know that you're going to be comfortable with the finances and stuff, generally it's going to be so much cheaper and so much safer than where you're coming from that there really isn't a big risk. Uh, there may be this, oh, it just isn't the country for us risk. That's very real. So as long as you have that acceptance of I can move on, then really anyone can come in and say, I'm going to stay as long as I feel comfortable. And when I'm bored or decide it's not for me or just get so interested in another place that I'm going to move on to that place, move on, then taking that risk of not having visited first is absolutely fine. And I did this for a lot of countries, never once encountered a problem, never was in a position where I wanted to leave sooner. It could happen, but never did. Never in a position where I was scared, never in a position where I was like, we made a big mistake. We always knew about what the financial picture was going to be ahead of time. We always made sure that it was, you know, reasonably safe. And then everything else, just discover as you go. Now, some people are very inflexible. Some people just can't handle being in a new culture. Even if they spoke the language, it would just all be too much. And they'll be like, I can't do this. If that's you, you probably know, don't do that. But um, I know we very often on this show caution people that you really should be coming in and visiting. Come for a weekend, come for a week, come for a month before you make that bigger commitment. And generally, that's smart. And for 90% of you, that's what you should do, mostly because you can. But if you're in a position where you're just completely open to moving to a new place and moving on when uh, you decide it's not for you, why do this extra step? Just come on down, save the money, make the leap, and, and have all your stuff, uh, right? When we came, uh, the first time we came, everything in our luggage, we were 11 pieces of luggage. It's not the first spot we were like that. And when we had to move on, we moved on because of a family emergency, not because we wanted to leave Nicaragua. Um, and it was very flexible. We could move in and out whenever it made sense for us. And the only thing we had to worry about was the cost of flights. And so by minimizing those cost of flights, not doing extra exploratory trips, uh, it did save us money. So I don't want to say that something that was very successful for us isn't something that you should ever do. It certainly could be uh, within your portfolio of possible moving options, but generally you want to do some amount of research before you make that much of a leap, especially if you have kids with you, uh, just because you want to have an idea of what you're getting into. So for most of you, yes, still do those trips. But if you're in a position where you feel it doesn't make sense to do that, it is an exception that is a uh, minority, but a significant enough number that it's not unreasonable for that to come up for you. Now, let's get into the real concern on today's question. So the real reason I'm making the video is to address a situation where a family with children uh, needs to move down and is looking at a number of factors. They're looking for what they hope is going to be a permanent home where they can really settle in. They're hoping that they can get out of the country that they're in currently uh, relatively quickly, uh, and they're looking at potentially a financial crunch in doing so. And they're worried that making the leap to Nicaragua may be beyond them or may be uh, very scary. And, and obviously, anytime you're in that kind of situation where you feel you have to move uh, because you're being forced to, just you know, life and society factors or whatever, um, that's a bit scary. And anytime you're in a financial crunch, that's going to be scary. And for most people traveling to a new country, going to be at least somewhat scary. Somewhat exciting, but probably somewhat scary. Going to any new region always carries a little bit of fear, even if it's just, I don't know how to get through the airport and I'm going to be stressed out because I don't know where to go. Right. Like we all feel it. Even just even just going to a new airport sometimes is a little bit scary until you get used to it. So I totally, totally understand that. And that's why I want to address that in this video. So in this particular situation where we're dealing with one, the financial aspects, they're concerned about the finances of where they are. And uh, they know that moving to another country long term is probably going to be a good financial move. But it's something that they're worried about. So I want to address this part first. So in uh, places like the U.S. and Canada, uh, cost of living is extremely high under normal circumstances. And this comes into play in every aspect of life. You probably need to own a car. You probably have to uh, pay exorbitant costs to commute to work. In most cases, you probably have a house that costs you quite a bit of money. Housing is just expensive in those countries. Uh, food is generally quite expensive. Ancillary shopping and things that you need and school costs and stuff just end up being higher. Clothing, every little thing typically costs more and more than most places in the world. They're not the worst, but they're they're on the very, very high side. They're in the 98th percentile or so of cost. And so uh, uh, just by existing in the U.S. and Canada, while there are ways to shave your costs significantly, living in places like Alabama, Mississippi, Oklahoma, Arkansas, right, there's a band of really low cost places low, really low cost by American standards that helps you uh, cost less money, be less expensive day to day. 
but that only shaves so much. Um, and in those places, there are, you know, generally lower paying salaries that offset that. So it's rare that it really helps a lot. But if you're out of work, those places can help you survive. But generally, there's fewer social services. So you, they may actually be harder. It, it's, it's a complicated thing. But generally, the United States is quite expensive. But I just want to point out that it's kind of like Costa Rica. We say Costa Rica is so expensive. And some people are like, I managed to live in Costa Rica for under $1,200 a month. I don't know what you're talking about. Yes, if you're just eating rice and beans, you're just cooking at home, you're living in the jungle in some remote location on land that no one is interested in, and you built a shed, of course, you can find ways to live cheaply in Costa Rica, but it'll never be as cheap as the same situation in Nicaragua, but it might get close because it's so undesirable. And of course, the same thing can happen in the United States. Well, I'm living with family, or I'm just in a shed in the woods and no one has caught me yet, whatever. There's ways to make it less expensive, but it'll never be as inexpensive as living as well or better in Costa Rica, and again, never as good or better as the same thing in Nicaragua. So there's ways to step up given the same situation. So the financial picture of, especially in a situation where they may be unemployed soon, if you're going to be unemployed, unemployed in the U.S. means you're bleeding out that money really quickly or as, about as quickly as you could. And Canada is very similar. Uh, and if you move to Nicaragua, you kind of uh, stem that as much as reasonable. This is the best mitigation that you're going to get in the region. Now, of course, if you're unemployed, moving to Nicaragua means that the tax advantage uh, that you can get by being here cannot help you. You're only looking at cost of living improvements until such time as a new job kicks in. And that will still take um, about a year before the big tax advantages from that kick in. You got to put in a year before you can take advantage of those as an expat. We have some videos for Americans that talk about that. For Canadians, it's much more complex, but it's more or less a similar situation. It is quite different under the hood how you have to do it, but the, the realities of it tend to be about the same. Uh, but the um, the financial picture here, the ability to, uh, let's just say that their rent in the United States is, we'll say it's been very cheap, $800 a month. Coming to Nicaragua, a, a place that's 800 in the U.S., you might be able to get for two or 300 in Nicaragua. That food that you're eating for, let's say, $1,000 in a month in the United States, that same food. Here might be $500, $600. It's not necessarily half. It depends if you're cooking at home or uh, what kind of food you're willing to have, how much you're willing to adjust to the local food. The more you adjust to local food, the cheaper it gets, right? Start eating plantains, which Americans, one, would be expensive, like getting plantains in the United States, and two, never do. Do that same thing here. Suddenly, plantains are a huge part of your diet and so cheap, like crazy crazy cheap. So use those as your starch source in many cases, and that will make it very inexpensive. So as long as you're willing and able to make those adaptations to local food sources, you'll find a big drop in food costs and often a good rise in food quality. Often you find that just everyone gets healthier because the food sources here are quite good. And in the U.S., it's notoriously possibly the worst in the world. Famously, uh, even Canada is starting to look at uh, blocking food coming from the U.S. Mexico has blocked food coming from the U.S. The EU blocks food coming from the U.S. Nicaragua wants nothing to do with it and so forth. Uh, so, so from those expenses, just nowhere reasonably that you can get to from North America is going to cut your daily costs as significantly and as quickly as Nicaragua. And then once you start working, you have that tax advantage as well that many places have, but Nicaragua specifically certainly does have, and that will uh, grow that. So we generally say that your purchasing power parity or how far your dollar goes is 300% here as what it is in the United States. That's not an exact number. There is a place that does research and comes up with an exact number, but it's really close to that. So basically, if you have $500 in the US, it's going to feel like $1,500 if you're here in Nicaragua with the same $500. Everything goes three times as far. If you have enough money to live for four months in the United States in cash, then chances are you can live at a roughly the same quality of life. Things will be very different, but the same quality of life here in Nicaragua for a year. Right. So hopefully that makes sense. And so as long as you're in a situation where you're living off of savings or you have a job that allows you to keep working the same with the same income in both places, you are financially incentivized and heavily to get to Nicaragua as quickly as possible. Every day that you're in the United States, you are spending the money of three days of being in Nicaragua. Now, most people will spend more when they get to Nicaragua because they'll be like, my money goes so far, I want to spend more. So they'll, they'll t tend to get a nicer house. They'll tend to be in a nicer neighborhood. They'll tend to go out to eat more, right? So you don't generally actually spend one third as much. Typically, you spend quite a bit less, but you also balance it with getting quite a bit more for your money. So a lot of people, when you talk to them, their budgets don't actually decrease as much as that. But if you need to, you certainly can. And of course, you can pull way back as part of the move and try to save even more. But the move generally uh, does take some financial resources. The reason that we mentioned Nicaragua specifically for this 
And that's so close to North America. There are many countries, especially in Southeast Asia and some in Africa, that will allow you to cut your expenses even further, but they have very long, very difficult, uh, and very expensive flights to get there. And so it's very difficult to make up for the cost of those flights and the time and the risk. And you can't just move on to another country generally very easily. And many of them have more difficult. Southeast Asia is pretty good. Africa is quite a bit harder for getting really good long term stay visas, whereas Nicaragua, once you're in, pretty much you're going to be safe. There'll be exceptions. But generally, you'll be able to stay. And if you can't stay, there's generally ways to figure that out within the region. We have really good regional support for people from North America who are interested in staying long term within the region and are willing to have a little bit of flexibility to do that. That may take some creative thinking. But that's only in those situations where you're not able to, within a reasonable amount of time, come up with a way to stay in Nicaragua permanently. It's extremely rare. I've never really encountered anyone who's had to do that. But mitigation strategies here exist like they exist nowhere else in the world. This is the best region simply because of the way that small, very similar countries, um, not, to, not to lump them together, but they are historically only separate for the last 200 years. <clears throat> Uh, very similar countries that you are able to easily move between in the region. Uh, and that gives you a lot of additional power and safety to be able to make that leap and say, okay, I don't know what we're going to do, but financially Nicaragua is going to protect us starting day one. Every day we're not in Nicaragua, we're in more risk. So that's a risk mitigation. Right? So that entire aspect of coming to Nicaragua there, it should be it should be instant comfort. And I know emotionally change scary, but financially it is more comfortable the moment you get to Nicaragua and that fear that what if we're not able to stay reasonably once you're, you're flexible enough to be able to use the region, which is a very small area, you have a lot of additional protections to help get you through until you figure out how you're going to stay permanently in Nicaragua, if that was to ever come up. And again, not knowledgeable of anyone who's ever had to do that. Just there's so many fallbacks in this region is what makes it so good compared to, say, Tanzania. You, you have a very different uh, physical layout. The, the ability to bounce between local countries to, to deal with some things exists, but it's much more difficult, much more expensive, uh, partially due to just physical distance uh, between things. <clears throat> okay, so that's the financial picture. Now let's talk about the physical risk feature, right? Nicaragua is actually safer than uh, most of the areas uh, where you would be potentially coming from. And now there's some areas that there's arguments about how safe it is. Uh, the Canadian government says Canada is very safe now. Canadians are constantly telling me that, yeah, it's still safe-ish, but it's not nothing like it was before. And the reality is, is it may be as dangerous as the U.S. now. Probably not, but getting towards there. So a lot of Canadians come here and say, no, they actually at least feel safer in Nicaragua if can't prove that it is actually safer. But that is a common uh, thing that Canadians are saying Nicaragua feels safer. And uh, statistically, it is certainly safer than the United States. Not by a lot. The U.S. is quite safe and had a really good year in improving air safety last year. But uh, the, the risks still exist. So uh, Nicaragua being the safest long-term country in the region, that's another great reason to come here is that, especially if you're trying to mitigate uh, financial risks in the United States, you tend to gravitate towards a very dangerous zone. The American South, Oklahoma, Arkansas, that region tends to have very high crime, very high violent crime. So if you want to save money in the U.S., you end up being in more dangerous situations. If you are very affluent and can live in places like New York, Massachusetts, and so forth, you tend to have very low crime. So unlike the United States, uh, Nicaragua is not a pay to play for safety. And in fact, Leon, one of the cheapest, if not the cheapest, pretty sure it's not the cheapest, but it is certainly on the inexpensive side of cities. And it's certainly the cheapest large city in Nicaragua is also the safest and possibly the safest city in all of Latin America. So you don't have to pay high, you know, upstate New York or, or rural Massachusetts or Connecticut, uh, New Hampshire, prices to get that really extreme level of safety. You can actually save money and be safe at the same time. Less conveniences, of course, than say a uh, Managua or a Matagalpa, which may have more things locally and you don't have to, you know, do as much effort for logistics or whatever. And, and you take a small additional amount of uh, crime that comes with that, uh, that you and those places are still very safe. But you can save money and be safer if that's what you choose to do. Now, the weather's super hot, and super hot places do tend to have less crime just because it's annoying to get all sweaty while committing crimes. Hey, criminals are sometimes lazy. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but that's often what leads to crime. And then when it's really 
inconvenient to commit crimes. It's also what makes them wait for another time or go to another location. So yeah, we're taking advantage of our super hot temperatures here from a crime perspective, but it's a real thing. So from safety and finances, you should have really high comfort coming from North America uh, and many other places in the world to Nicaragua and many other places in Latin America that you will save money immediately, that you are not making a, a dangerous leap and that that local safety is so good that uh, you can feel just good about all those decisions. You can jump in blindly and not worry about having visited the country first. Now, you always have that fear that you're not going to like the culture, that you're not going to like the food, that it really is warmer than you expected. Uh, that's just not the vibe you were hoping for. Those are all real things. But if you're in that panic situation, you feel like you need to get to a place to have a certain level of safety one way or another for your family, then I think this is a situation where looking at Nicaragua and saying, okay, the things that I would actually be worried about, the things that are of real solid concrete concern actually should drive me there as fast as possible and I shouldn't have to worry about them. Those aren't the things that are going to get me. Now, actually hunting down for a good rental house and finding the right place, that will probably be some effort. That'll be work and you're going to have to, you know, hit the streets and really focus on that for a little bit. But once you find a good place, and especially if you know you're making a commitment and you're not looking at uh, short-term rentals more than you know, a week or two or whatever you need to do to find a long-term rental, uh, then as soon as you can find that long-term rental, you can get into an unfurnished place, sign a reasonable lease, at least six months, generally uh, 12 months, but somewhere in that region. Uh, and then you can, as long as you, you know, give yourself that week or two here, okay, we really, it's going to be okay. We can do this. Then start buying your appliances and such. Put your, your investment money towards those things so you don't have to rent them. You don't have to go out to eat or whatever uh, as quickly as possible. Get into an unfurnished apartment, put those things into it and start saving that money. That's where your really big savings are going to happen really quickly. That's where your protections are going to come in. So those are things that I recommend uh, from, a, from a thought process, right? Don't be concerned about the things that are going to get better, the things that are basically guarantees to improve physical safety and, and finances. It's the, it's the cultural things. It's the logistics of getting uh, into the country that are really going to be a little bit more difficult. Now this viewer had some questions about the best way to get to Nicaragua with a full family and potentially pets, and this is difficult. Yes, flights are one option and driving is another, and they are aware if they decide to drive, they have a long way to go. They have a lot of borders to cross, a lot of things that they've never done before. This is their first time traveling internationally at all, so this makes the whole thing just so much scarier. Totally understand. If you're going to drive down, the, th the big scary thing there is that you're going to be tackling a long distance that is exhausting and difficult, easy to navigate, but very, very difficult to physically do. That includes a lot of borders. And each one of those borders is scary and confusing and takes time and just makes the whole process that much harder. But if you're looking to get out of the U.S. as soon as possible, getting in a car and just crossing the border into Mexico is going to be the fastest thing. If you're coming from Canada, crossing into the U.S. and then crossing into to Mexico is going to get you into Latin America right away. And in theory, you could then slow down and take your time, spend a little bit of time being a digital nomad in Mexico, even if it's just five days, travel on weekends and make it not so bad. You'll be down in a couple weeks and make it not that scary. Now, if you're going to drive down, they are aware of this, but for other people who are who are watching and may not be aware, you can't keep your car here. You need to turn around and take that back to the United States right away, more or less, or to wherever it's from. So it's important that you don't try to keep a car in Nicaragua. People often are just like, I'm going to do a one-way drive. I'll keep your car. Can't do that. That will be disastrous for the short term. You can try to make it work. You will be super sorry. It will destroy your process. It really will. But if as long as you plan on driving it back, get the family down, drop off the kids, the dogs, everybody, and then just one person runs it back as, uh, you know, as quickly as they can and, and then sells it or whatever, that's absolutely fine. And that is an option. Just you have to gauge that amount of driving. That is, that is a crazy amount of driving. The other thing, if you're going to fly, the thing that we did, and I think this works for a lot of people, if you know this is going to be one way, you got to unload those vehicles. Well, we did, and I don't remember what company it was, but we'll just say CarMax because I can remember the name. Uh, we drove to the airport where we're going to fly. So there's three airports in the United States that come directly to Nicaragua. And if you're in Canada, you have to get to one of those airports as well. And that is Miami is the major one, and then Houston and Dallas. So IAH in Houston, um, <clears throat> it's actually Fort Lauderdale in Miami in most cases, sometimes MIA, uh, actual Miami, but normally it's Fort Lauderdale. 
and uh, FLL, I believe it is, and then um, DFW in Dallas. They're the ones who have flights into this region. Hobby in Houston and uh, Love in Dallas do have flights to Liberia, Costa Rica, which is a potential option as well, but it's not really giving you more cities to fly from, to the best of my knowledge. Do some research. There may be some way to fly to Costa Rica and then drive up. That is actually pretty easy as long as you're coming into Liberia. If you have pets, that one's not too bad. If you have, uh, don't have pets, then going on to San Jose and coming up by bus isn't so bad either. I, I would do that any given time if it was cheaper or more convenient. Uh, so, so part of it is getting into the region and being a little bit flexible. But chances are a direct flight to Managua is going to be the thing you want to do because when you're bringing all your stuff, when it's just a casual trip, you can do a lot of things flexibly. But when you're bringing your life with you, you probably want to get direct and minimize the number of things that are going on. So you want to get to an airport and not do a bunch of connections. That is the worst thing to do on a major trip if you could avoid it. So what we did, because we were on the East Coast, we drove to Miami and took uh, a private plane when we actually came down. We didn't take Spirit. We take Spirit all the other times, but we took a private plane on our first one because we were bringing our dogs, but we had to do that out of a Fort Lauderdale airport. It wasn't actually FLL, but it was, it was right there. So we drove to the airport. I dropped everyone off. I ran. It was really actually the next day. We drove next to the airport, stayed in a hotel, went to CarMax, sold the car, had it all lined up ahead of time. So it'd be, they knew we were coming. We knew what was going on. It took like four hours, whatever. I dropped it off, got the money, and went back to the hotel, and then we just took a shuttle from the hotel to the airport and flew on. By doing that, we eliminated any connecting flights, any of those huge disasters that might go wrong, uh, knew that we had all of our ducks in a row and that we were just gonna get on that one flight and be in Managua. Once you're in Managua, everything is easy. We had a driver lined up. We were able to just throw everything into the van and go on. And we had friends waiting for us. We had everything lined up and we were able to head out uh, to our house hours away. Um, and then ended up staying across the street from our house anyway. And uh, so that really it made it so much cheaper, so much easier. So the same thing. If you're looking at coming from anywhere in North America, get to one of those three airports. It's United out of Houston, uh, American out of Dallas, American hops through MIA Miami, uh, and uh, Spirit out of Fort Lauderdale. And I believe Avianca is Fort Lauderdale, but I m it might be Miami. Um, and, and then they offer some that connect through El Salvador. That's fine. Once you're doing that, the, the El Salvador hop really isn't bad, but direct to Managua is awfully nice and will reduce your panic and reduce your risk a bit. But El Salvador is within the region. It's very close. You can take shuttles from there if you have to. I'm comfortable. I would be comfortable adding El Salvador as a hop. But if you can avoid it, obviously, it's beneficial to do so. So if you're doing any of those flights, I would recommend driving to that airport, selling your car there, and making it all that much easier, that little bit of extra effort to drive to the right place and not have to take any flights inside uh, Canada or the US uh, to get to the right airport, I think will make things much better. And just be prepared that if anything goes wrong, you're gonna be stuck near that airport until you get things figured out. We know people who just did this ended up getting their paperwork given to them wrong. By the time they got to the airport, they were screwed. They had to turn around and they may have a year to delay on their move. So some of those things can get kind of complicated. That's where driving does have some benefits. Once you're over that first border, you're figuring everything out from inside Mexico or infra inside Guatemala, which are low cost and, and starting your process of moving rather than delaying it indefinitely while you figure things out in the United States. So that's just something to think about. But um, so the other thing that I wanted to touch on, and because this family that is looking to move, it is their first time leaving the country. So this is really big. They've barely traveled inside the country. They've not seen very much of the US and Canada. So um, even the idea of just travel is kind of scary. Also, certainly super exciting, but very scary and loads of unknowns, loads of new things being introduced to them. Uh, so anything that they do is going to be a lot. And one of the things that is scary is making this leap to a new country when you haven't traveled, like is so much scarier. There's so much like, what if something goes wrong? Well, and, 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 can you mitigate that when you have to skip doing an, an earlier trip, right? Going back to our earlier discussion of they probably are not able to come and see Nicaragua in this particular instance before they make the jump to it. So what happens if they do get here? Um, and, and so this is a, how do I phrase this? A very logical analysis of the risk. 
So the risk is by not spending time and money earlier to do an analysis of Nicaragua to verify that it's the right thing, what if uh, they could have learned from that that it was not the right place? Well, that doesn't carry the risk that it seems like. So what's the worst case scenario? You come down to Nicaragua and realize it's the wrong place. You've spent that time and money. Now you have to start your investigation over again somewhere else. It's like Guatemala or Colombia, uh, Bolivia, something like that. So you start this process again and you go evaluate that place. Now remember, this only matters, this only works when you know the place is cheap and safe. But Nicaragua is extremely cheap and super safe. So it's a great place to play out this scenario. So instead of doing that uh, fact-finding trip, let's say it costs uh, X, you move the entire family and it costs 2X. You make the full leap and you do the move. Okay, you spent a little bit more, but you're in a place. You're now saving money, you're now safe, and now you can live there as long as it needs. Treat this like your initial fact-finding uh, mission. You're probably, while you spent more money moving, pretty quickly you'll start recuperating that by living in a lower cost place and solving whatever reason it is that you had to move out of the place that you were in initially that you wanted to leave. If you find that you went to the right place, you like it, whether you absolutely love it and you're like, I couldn't go anywhere else, or you just like it. Oh, this is perfectly good for us. We're happy. In both cases, you are set. Stay forever. Stay for a long time. Whatever works best for you. If you want to move on to another place, you can do so. Chances are moving on to the next place will cost less coming from here than it did coming from where you started. But even if you assume it costs the same, it costs 2x again. You've now moved to two countries over a period of time for 4x total cost. Had you done that fact-finding first, you'd have spent 1x, then moved to the second country. Maybe you would have done a fact-finding to get there, assuming you needed to. If you're doing that process, you've already spent 2x on fact-finding and 2x on the final move. You're back up to 4x and you're only in the second country. So it's easy to see how it doesn't actually save the money, assuming these numbers are reasonable, uh, that you would assume. And if you end up finding that second country doesn't actually meet your needs because tourism doesn't teach you a whole lot about a place, well, you may actually end up spending more because you don't have that deep dive in learning about it and time to save money up front. So it's, it feels very scary to jump into a new country, and it reasonably is very scary. But from an actual financial analysis, if you're doing the right things and looking at it in the right way, it actually may be the financially reasonable thing to do even with the reasonable possibility that you will not go to the right country. So just assuming they move to Nicaragua and they give it a year and it turns out to be the wrong country. The ability to move on to another country is enhanced by being here as quickly as possible. Because it's cheap and because it's safe, they're saving money and protecting their family or keeping it as safe as they were before. It doesn't have to be that they're leaving because of, of safety issues or anything like that you now have the power to research the next country while spending less day-to-day -day on your lives. So you're in a better position by moving, by just jumping in with both feet the first time to make whatever leaps happen the next time under normal circumstances. And you will know more about yourself and travel. You will learn a bunch of ancillary things, not just about the country that you're moving to, uh, but how to move, things about yourself. You'll be prepared for a lot of stuff much better by doing so. And so I, I think in this scenario, while it seems really reckless and on the surface, everyone would agree, wow, moving to a country sight unseen, that's nuts. But when you know it's cheap and safe and you know you want to move, then actually making that leap, learning about yourself, building those skills, saving that money, and getting yourself into a better position for that might actually be completely logical and financially reasonable. And, and it's a, in this case, it's emotions, and I say this a lot, right, how emotions damage our decision making, but this is emotions making us do something where it feels like we're trying to, no, we gotta be conservative. No, actually, that fact-finding in this particular scenario actually feels like the reckless thing jump in, get to Nicaragua, that actually makes sense, and then figure out the rest of your life from a better position. And it's very similar to what my family did. We did a bunch of research, a lot more, did a lot more travel, and then at the end, my wife had this feeling, but we need to find perfect. We need to go to every country that we could reasonably go to, not every country, but a hundred countries, evaluate them all, and then based on having been in all of them decide which one is absolutely perfect for us. And that's not actually the best process because you will spend all your time 
in the decision making, you'll never get time to enjoy the country. We had to, at some point, pull the trigger. We've been to many countries, we've investigated a lot of countries, we've visited, we've lived in, and at some point, nothing was competing with Nicaragua in a serious way. Some things were good, a lot of places we'd love to live, not, not like we wouldn't want to live there, but no place was making us able to make a final decision. By moving to Nicaragua, we were able to change our every day. So our base, our cost, our, our, our center of our lives was no longer in the U.S. We were not going back to the U.S. as our, our launching point. We come back to Nicaragua as our launching point, and we visit and tour the world from here rather than this just being another point that we visit. And by doing that, we lowered our cost, increased our power, and made ourselves way happier because our base of operations is a place we absolutely love instead of a place that we're trying to get away from. And we don't have to worry about ever finding a place that's better because we don't know that we ever would. We love it here. Now when we visit other places, it's to enjoy them and to consider maybe we want to spend a bit more time there, but not that we want to get away from the place that we're in. And that's hopefully what you're going to do, right? Even if it's not the right place, what if we moved to Nicaragua and decided it wasn't the permanent place? Well, we still made every day that we're here versus where we came from better. And every day that we're here, we're saving more money, giving ourselves more financial power and more knowledge about ourselves and the world to make better decisions about any potential future place we could decide to move to. And that's where you will be, I believe, is that by the sooner you're able to get to Nicaragua, the sooner you will be empowered both emotionally and financially and in other ways as well to make good decisions about whether this is the right place that you want to stay forever or how to better hone your next decision about where you're going to move to next and you'll have more money and research and knowledge to do so. And so while it feels reckless, I think it's anything but. I hope this uh, belays a bunch of fears. I hope this uh, makes you feel confident that you're able to actually pull the trigger and make this happen and, and make the, the improvements for your family that you're hoping for. And for everyone, of course, get down those comments. Let me know uh, any questions, comments, just say hello. Uh, send in video questions of yourself. That's always awesome. Uh, if you'd like to support the channel, we'll put up a link. You can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. Uh, we also have our show membership for anyone who wants to commit to a $5 monthly uh, sponsorship to help make all this possible. It is very expensive to do the show. Really appreciate everyone who joins us and watches the show, and I will see all of you tomorrow.